This video was sponsored by Surfshark VPN. More on them later. Hey everyone, Jack Byer here with NASA Spaceflight. There are major design changes coming to Starship and Super Heavy, which is to be expected. After all, we're still in the prototyping stage. Starships are getting cargo doors, boosters are getting aero surfaces, both are getting new engines, and much more. In this video, we'll cover those changes, both small and large, and we'll answer the question, what does a Super Heavy booster have in common with an SR-71 Blackbird? Starship's development program is characterized by its fail-fast, fix-fast approach to design and flight. Between Starhopper and Ship 20, we've seen huge changes to vehicles as well as the testing and launching of them. Ship 20, currently at the orbital launch site, is the first ship with a full thermal protection system, all six engines, and many other improvements and additions. But it is already functionally out of date, so much so that it can't be launched on any other booster than B4 or perhaps B5. Super Heavy has also evolved from the first vehicle, booster number one, which was used as a construction pathfinder and never received engines, to the more recent booster four, with 29 engines, engine shields, COPV aero covers, grid fins, and all the things you would expect from a fully fledged Super Heavy booster ready for flight. However, at this point, booster four, as complete as it may seem, is woefully out of date as well, as we will show when discussing the changes coming to booster seven and beyond. Before we go into the design changes, we first need to discuss how SpaceX refers to different barrel sections internally. It essentially just depends on the amount of rings that they are made out of. It's pretty self-explanatory, but a quint is a five ring barrel, a quad is a four ring barrel, a triple is three rings, a double is two, and a single is, well, just a single ring. Right now, Starship vehicles are made out of a nine meter cylindrical body section consisting of 20 rings, each about six feet tall, with a rounded nose cone on top. The nose cone helps for aerodynamics and supports the forward flaps, but it also houses the important LOX header tank at the very tip. These 20 rings are spread out over five sections. The aft section, the mid LOX section, the common dome section, the forward dome section, and the nose cone barrel section. Looking at this graphic, you can immediately see how things are changing from the Ship 20 style design to the new Ship 24 Plus style. The vehicle is still 20 rings tall without a nose cone, but the allocation of which section gets what rings has changed. First up, the aft section is changing from a quint to a quad, and the quick disconnect plate is moving up one ring. The previous design had it on the second ring, and now it's on the third ring, right below the aft dome. A potential reason for this could be that SpaceX wanted to shorten the length of the plumbing that goes from the cutie plate and into the tanks. Another reason could be the addition of three extra Raptor vacuum engines on the ship, a future design change that Elon has hinted at. This change might allow them to add these engines more easily, since the QD plumbing might get in the way with the previous design. Another change to the aft section is visible in how Starship and Booster connect. In the old design, the booster had three little nubs that went into corresponding holes on the ship. However, this has been reversed on Booster 7, Ship 22, and beyond. This reversal means that the ship has the positive side and the booster has the negative side of the connection. That's why Ship 20 would not be able to launch on or even be stacked on top of Booster 7. The connections between the two just don't match. Finally, on the aft section, we've seen new ship aft domes with redesigned thrust pucks delivered, and they look to have different connections for the engines. This is to accommodate the new Raptor 2 engine, which will be introduced on all upcoming ships and boosters. The mid lock section is staying the same, but because the section below is now four rings instead of five, it sits one ring lower in the stack. The common dome section gains the ring the aft section lost, turning it from a triple into a quad, and the methane header tank is removed, joining the LOX header tank in the nose cone. The common dome section also contains the main LOX tank vents, which have changed as well. On super heavy boosters, the LOX tank vents serve a dual purpose, both as a vent and a thruster. In fact, in the latest render from SpaceX, we can see these vents on the LOX tank being used to flip the booster for the boost back burn. The covers on these vents reorient the thrust of the gas being released from the tank. It appears that the same will be true for Starship, as its LOX tank vents have gotten the same covers. Here we can see they're visible on Ship 22, which is now on display in the rocket garden at Starbase. And here they're on Ship 24's common dome section in the midbay. There's a good possibility that the ship will use these vents for attitude control during flight, just as the booster does. This might also explain the lack of RCS thrusters on the newest nose cones. Since they're using the vents from the tanks, the presence of RCS thrusters would be redundant and therefore removed from the design. 
Next, the forward dome section is changing from a quad into a triple, basically giving one of its rings to the nose cone barrel section. The nose cone barrel section goes from a quad to a quint, presumably to aid cargo door design and manufacturing. Speaking of the cargo door, it looks like SpaceX is finally ready to incorporate one on Ship 24. Mary caught this payload dispenser mechanism being lowered into Ship 24's nose cone barrel recently. This same nose cone barrel has been spotted with a small opening seemingly suitable for deploying Starlink satellites from. So maybe we'll see some mass simulators, or who knows, even real Starlinks involved in the upcoming first orbital flight of Starship in some way. Next, let's talk about the nose cone. The old nose cone design is made out of four rows of stamped sections, which each are welded together to form a row. Then those rows are welded together to form a nose cone. In the new design, instead of stamp forming the sections, they're stretch formed. This allows each nose cone to be made of two rows of panels instead of four. Another change to the nose cone is the move of the methane header tank from the common dome section into the nose cone. This was confirmed by Elon on Twitter a few weeks ago, but sadly we don't yet know the shape or position of the methane header tank inside the new design. We can see that on this most recently constructed nose cone, presumably destined for Ship 24, there are two header tank vents, whereas Ship 20 and earlier had only one. This new nose cone is still under construction, so things could change, but it notably seems to lack RCS thruster ports in favor of using the LOX tank vents on the common dome section, as we discussed a moment ago. Domes with a flatter profile are also coming. We've seen one at the production site recently, and I wouldn't be surprised if we soon see a test tank of some kind made with them. There are some design changes that have been teased or mentioned by Elon, but that we haven't seen any evidence of yet. These include stretching Starship's tank section, changes in flap placement or static aero surfaces on the nose cone, or the increase of Raptor engines on the ship from six to nine. So those are all the changes that we've been able to see and account for on Starship's design. Now, let's discuss the Super Heavy Booster. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this video, Surfshark VPN. The same way that we can watch and analyze all the activity at Starbase because it happens out in the open, when you browse the internet out in the open, companies are able to track your every click. They can tell what kind of device you're on, what OS you have, where you are, where you've been, and then use or sell that information. A VPN like Surfshark masks your IP address and encrypts your data. This stops companies, hackers, and everyone else from tracking you and selling info about you, which keeps you safe online whether you're at home or on public Wi-Fi. Plus, as an added bonus, you can travel the world in just a single click by setting your virtual location to wherever you please. This means you can stream shows or use services that aren't available in whatever country you're currently in. How neat is that? Save 83% and get an extra three months free right now by going to the link below and entering the promo code NASA Spaceflight when you sign up. We can't do these longer, higher production value videos relying on YouTube ad revenue alone. So thanks again to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Super Heavy's design changes seem to center around improvements to optimize the dry mass of the booster, while also trying to reduce the amount of propellant needed to land the booster back on the catch arms. Little change is visible to the booster barrel sections except for one small but interesting change on the thrust section. In boosters 3, 4, and 5, the thrust section, which contains the aft dome and connections to the outer 20 engines, was made out of a triple or three ring section, with each ring being a standard 1.8 meters or 6 feet tall. However, on booster 7, the thrust section is a quad, each one being 1.4 meters tall or 4.5 feet. It's odd to see a non-standard ring height, and it's unclear why this change has been made. Also, in past boosters, there were stringers where the aft dome and barrel were welded together, but with booster 7 and up, the stringers extend all the way down the barrel. This could be because additional reinforcement is needed now that the boosters will have more thrust. Where's that thrust coming from, you ask? Booster 7 and later will be sporting the new Raptor 2 engine, compared to booster 4's Raptor 1.5's, resulting in the increased thrust mentioned a moment ago. We've already seen new thrust pucks, which are officially known as aft caps, arrive at the production site that can hold up to 13 engines, and when added with the 20 outer engines, this makes up a total of 33 engines on the booster. We can see the connections for the engines are completely different from previous aft caps, which tells us that this is going to be for a new version of the Raptor engine. This is further confirmed by Elon's comments during the recent Starship presentation, as well as on Twitter. Another new change coming up on Booster 7 and later is also related to its landing. In particular, its landing tank, what we call the header tank on the ship. 
we've gotten hints from Elon at the existence of a tank used for booster landings. On Booster 5, this tank took the form of a long tube on one side of the main LOX tank. But that design did not last long. On Booster 7, the new design seems to be a tank that encloses the transfer tube and shares the same center axis, which makes it a coaxial tank, instead of one that sits off to the side of the LOX tank like on Booster 5. The LOX in this landing tank supplies the center three engines for the landing burn, preventing the potentially deadly sloshing of propellants in the same way the header tanks on Starship do. We can see in pictures taken by Mary that the new transfer tubes come with a plate at the bottom that has three evenly spaced holes. This strongly suggests that these are to provide the locks for the center three engines. On the new booster design, we can see how the pressurization lines that go into each tank have changed in number. On booster four and booster five, there were four pressure lines for each tank. On booster seven, there are now only two per tank and they're both next to each other. This certainly makes the booster pipes look more tidy. Finally, in perhaps the most visually distinct changes to either ship or booster, super heavy boosters are getting aero surfaces. In the last few weeks, we've seen these cryptically named nominal segments delivered to the production site. At the same time, the arrangement of COPVs on the outside of Booster 7 has changed from a ring around the thrust section to two columns on each side of the vehicle. Now, we can see that the nominal segments have begun to be installed over the COPVs, forming what are known in aeronautics as chines though that term actually originated from shipbuilding. If you don't know what a chine is, take a look at the famed SR-71 Blackbird, the long, thin extensions of the main fuselage that are characteristic of its design are chines. Or if you prefer, the space shuttle also has chines, and they're especially visible on Columbia, seen here as the black sections. One thing we aren't yet sure about is how many chines there will be. You might expect there to be two chines 180 degrees opposed on the booster, but it looks like there could be mounting points for four. Compared to Booster 4's simple aero covers that enclose and protect the COPVs, this new design is ingenious and means that these parts will serve a dual purpose, both protecting the COPVs and adding additional cross-sectional surface area. This could be beneficial in a few different ways. First, it would give the booster additional cross range when returning to Earth after lofting a starship into orbit, meaning it would be able to glide a farther distance to the landing site without needing to burn extra propellant on its boost back burn. On top of that, the extra drag would reduce its approach velocity, and since the booster would be going slower, less propellant would be needed for landing. Less propellant needed for boost back and landing burns means that the booster would be able to use that propellant instead to burn for a longer duration during first stage flight with Starship on top. This increases the payload mass that the Starship can carry into orbit. It's pretty amazing how some seemingly minor little nubs can have such a significant effect. Yet, when we lay out the benefits they provide, it seems like almost a no-brainer to include them. Instead of just having the dead mass of aero covers as seen on Booster 4, Put that mass to use as an aero surface, save some fuel, and increase your payload to orbit. The design of ship and booster is constantly changing. The iterations on the drawing board at SpaceX necessarily outpace the versions we see in real life. It could be that in time, changes mentioned in this video are iterated on further, or even reversed back to a previous design. However, this is the current state of Starship and Super Heavy design as we understand it in March of 2022. We'll just have to wait and see how things change over time. That's it for this video. Let us know what you thought of it in the comments. Thanks to Pauline for help with the line art. Thanks to Lorelai for help with the motion graphics. And thanks to Nick for the renders. Thanks to Alex, Adrian, Chris G, and Ian for help on this script. And thanks to Mary and Nick for the footage used in the video. Stay tuned to our channel and the daily videos to keep your fingers on the pulse at Starbase Boca Chica. And don't forget, be excellent to each other.